so much for coming on the show and letting me know um, a little bit more about you know your background, your story. I know um, you guys are right around the corner doing great work. So why don't you let us know um, just who you are and what are you doing? Okay. So I'm Mel Price, and I'm one of the two um, founders of Work Program Architects, or WPA, here in downtown Norfolk. And um, we can talk about anything you want today, how we started up, but we run um, an architecture and urban design and interior design studio. And we work on all different scales of projects from um, kind of all over big picture city planning down to designing a really well-made sign for a university or a store. So we're really um, generalists and we work on this really wide spectrum of work. It's super exciting. So what was like your earliest memory with like design? Like Mm -hmm. did you all, were you a kid that like you were drawing Mm -hmm. and you were sketching and had this like plan from day one or did you fall into it? What was your path? I was 10 years old when I said I wanted to become an architect. Um, And I think it really started um, really with my dad, who's a banker. um, And he he was always giving construction loans to businesses that were starting up. And so banking has changed a lot. But back then he would bring blueprints home and he would roll them out and he would look at them and he was trying to evaluate whether it was a good business to lend to. So I saw blueprints and then my mom was an editor at the newspaper and she worked at night. And so when she went to work, he would sit me down and I guess to keep me busy, would teach me drawing lessons. Um, And then I was just one of those little kids that if I met a new friend and I was going over to their house for the first time, the first thing I said was, give me a tour of your house. So I was just really interested in buildings and and how they laid themselves out. Um, So that's when I got into it. And all right. I'm thinking about like, how do you look at a space when you walk into it and Mm -hmm. what, what, what type of like... So I know for me, like when I go in a mm-hmm. store, I'm just like, I know what it costs to be here. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like I know what, yeah. what this is. But like, do you are like, are you always thinking like st- structurally and just like thinking about the space and like, what like how do you look at like like a normal outing? <laughs> so it's everything. It's a restaurant. It's the dentist. It's a doctor's office. It's a shop. I mean, once you're, I think once you start thinking through the lens of design, it's hard to turn that off. That's yeah. just like a filter through which we see the world. So, um, so I, I'm really into lighting and good acoustics and just generally like a nice, clean, well oh, laid out you. space. that's <laughs> not full of clutter. Yeah. And, um, that's the kind of space I want to be in. And if I don't feel comfortable in that space, whether it's a restaurant or, you know, I, then I don't want to shop there or go there. So it's something that's really important to me. And that's your aesthetic too. It's like, yeah. I mean, when I walk past your office, I see kind of like the high ceilings. Yeah. Maybe explain a little bit about your firm. Maybe mm-hmm. talk about like, how did you, I'm skipping over like, you know how you got there so yeah. maybe maybe let me take a step back what what did you what was like the college experience like for you like uh-huh. what was it like um preparing for this career because yeah. you it's a it's a long kind of yeah it's a long track long track right um so i went to uh, the university of notre dame which is um really an oddity in the architectural world because mm. it's the only classical school of architecture in the country um miami mm. there's some others that are that are similar, but um, we were taught Beaux-Arts watercolor techniques. So everything I did was hand-drawn. Um, I, it's, it's me and a bunch of 95 year old men who still know how to paint this way. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, but it was cool. It was, um, the theory was you learn the rules before you break the rules and same with painting or architecture and any sort of design. And so we were taught traditional rules for laying out a building. And um, I think that type of architecture really prides itself on simplicity of plan. And we also uh, were never allowed to design a building that was just a building. It's always about how does it fit into the urban context? So anytime we had to solve a design problem, we had to solve a city problem. And so our project always had to go a couple blocks in any direction. 
we it was also pretty hands-on we had to use the wood shop we had to learn how to build a brick wall and how to um to kind of lay out a concrete floor so it, there was some different things to that um to their um way of educating that Small I really appreciate. Small class size, large class size. Small. I think maybe we had 45 people graduate. So it was small and close-knit. And we spent, um, everyone had to go to Rome for a year. And so we spent a year together traveling around in Europe. And is um, that kind of the, I don't want to say Mecca, but is that like the, that's like the place you really want to go if you're kind of starting in a early kind of architect career? Like, I ended there the, by chance. I just wanted to go to Europe for a year. So yeah, that's how okay. I ended up there. Um, I think it's, I don't know if that educational, I don't know how many young architects that would appeal to because I mean, what's really, what most people want to do is fun, cool, modern buildings and towers. So this is a little bit of uh, learning, you know, learning how it used to be done. But what it does is it gives you a really good eye for rhythm and symmetry and proportion. Got and it. all of the great modernists were kind of classically educated. So just a different experience than most people have. So did you did you ever work at a firm before mm -hmm. starting yours? And kind of maybe talk mm -hmm. about like the experience, like kind of transitioning mm -hmm. out. <clears throat> um, I worked, I did an internship here in Norfolk at Hanbury, which was a really wonderful experience. Um, and then uh, a couple of other firms, and um, then graduated and moved to um, California and started working for a small firm um, in La Jolla, and hmm. we were doing residential work, actually. Um, spent two years there, and then moved back here and started doing projects in the city I grew up in. And so that's a very smooth transition <laughs> there. Um, how easy or difficult was it to start your shop because mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like you know it can't be yeah it can't be that no, easy like um, you have to get clients and you have oh, yeah. to kind of yeah set things up for the first time maybe talk about like what, sure. was the, what was the first like 90 days of the job like it's funny that in looking it seems it was nine years ago now mm, um congrats thank you um it's funny how easy it seemed in some ways when it was really difficult and we were exhausted and, and all of that. But um, it, uh, we had, I'll, I'll just tell you our, our whole story, which is actually kind of interesting. We, um, I had someone approach me um, to team up with another company he'd put into business, a civil engineering firm. And so I met him for lunch and toward this other civil engineer's office and I didn't want to move. It was out in Virginia Beach um, at a location that didn't appeal to me as an architect. And I don't know what wild hair got into me, but I kind of just like flipped around and said, um, you know, I don't want to do this, but if you helped him start his business, would you help me with a loan to start my business? And I had never even, it just came out of my mouth. Um, and so I called Tom, my current partner, and we wrote a business plan. How did and you and Tom meet? We worked together um, at Time Off and Moss, another local architecture firm, and had also a small firm and had a really good experience working there and working together there. Um, so we wrote our plan, got our little startup seed money and put our own money into the company and opened in the Monticello Arcade where we are now. And in the first uh, first two weeks, so 10 days of business, we had 20 clients walk in the door. Amazing. And, and what do you think it was that made that happen? Was it the connections you had made from the time off and Moss stand? Mm -hmm. Or was it, were you, you know, knocking, knocking on doors, letting people know, hey, the shingle's up? How did... No, um... I think it was it was two different <laughs> things. One, it was we had developed relationships with people that cared about our success and honestly were just excited for us as new business owners and wanted to support us. So clients who never would have called me at my previous job mm. to be the person that they came to called because they wanted to support a new business. So we were really thankful for that. The second was the location and anyone starting an architecture firm, I would recommend start on the ground floor in the heart of downtown and you've walked through our building. It's a glass fishbowl. Yep. And so people like to see people making things and designing and so everyone could see in. And um, we, we 
created an office where people felt comfortable coming in. And I think it was really just foot traffic, too, of business people downtown who wanted to stop in. And then they came up with, you know, at first a small project and then medium, and we kind of grew with them. And what's a small project? Like, what, what, is the work, what is the work product that you were doing back, back then? Back then, um, uh, we were doing, like, a coffee shop or a restaurant. Um, one of my favorite projects was this beautiful sign that we did for, um, it was then Satya Yoga, and it was um, Satya, the name of the studio in Sanskrit, became a laser-cut stainless steel bracket that hung with this wooden sign that we had um, CNC routed. And so there was, we got to kind of design it and make it. So that was a very, it was the smallest project, but every, every scale project has design potential and meaning. And um, so the end of our first year, we won a very, very large um, $60 million project over at Norfolk State University. Yep. And so our company really scaled up faster than we expected because of that project. Did you write the plan or did you write the proposal or mm -hmm. maybe talk about the, how, how, do you, how do you land such a deal like that? <laughs> Good relationships with good people. Um, I had been working with um, the folks over at Norfolk State for several years at that point and had always, always answered the phone every time they called, took a meeting any time of day. Um, I think had really demonstrated that we were committed to them and in turn they trusted us to take on a very, very large project. Um, and. Uh, and they're a great client. They're, they're not many higher ed clients that would trust a new firm to do something like that. So they took a chance on us and we've flourished as a result. And so talk about the staffing up piece. So yeah. you started with two. Yes. And how many are you today? And what, yeah. what, do, what do the people do that work there? Like, yeah. yeah. Is everyone drawing? Is everyone worrying yeah. about the, you know, the relationships in the community? Yeah. Or like, how does that work? So, um, so we started with two of us, actually three of us, my husband, Peter as well, started from the beginning with us. We just didn't know that he was working. He didn't tell us. He just kept coming to work every day. And then we, <laughs> then we started to, to, uh, recognize that he was full time. Yep. Um, because we were doing very, um, kind of high profile work that first year, we had to hire people who had a similar level of experience. So we hired people we knew with 10 or 12 years of experience and kind of staffed up um, a little bit more laterally at kind of a really high, high level of experience. Um, now we have, I guess, seven architects, a graphic designer, an interior designer, an industrial designer, urban designer, a business development person, office manager, et cetera. So yeah. a couple of urban designers. So. Um, we have a, a wide range of experience, very interdisciplinary, but um, we run an open books, open finances business where we believe that it is important to learn all aspects of running a business, that that's important to being a good architect. And so everyone does have a business development role and has um, uh, decision-making powers that contributes to a project being profitable or not being profitable and, and everyone gets to see all of that. Hmm. So. Interesting. And so what type of, um, I guess you say you're kind of multidisciplinary. So like, mm -hmm. it's not like one specific industry vertical that you may focus on. Do you see like a trend or theme of like something that you maybe have worked on the most? So I would say, so we, We've, we kind of have two practices. So we have the architecture side and then the urban design side. So those are our two tracks. Um, on the urban design side, we are interested in working in communities that are, that are true urban communities or in more suburban areas that are trying to work on building urban cores. So if, we're, um, if it's truly a suburban project, we're probably not the right fit. But if we're working on um, solving challenges that have to do with being in a city, that's that's kind of in our group. Um, on the architecture side, we do anything from higher ed, which is what we really market to is K through 12 and higher ed. We love educational work. 
and then the rest of what we do kind of usually comes to us. So it's sometimes we compete for that, but most of the time, most of our effort in pursuing work is in K-12 and higher ed. And the rest of it is uh, focused on improving Norfolk and Virginia Beach and, you know, our greater community. And, and that is, we find ourselves in those, um, I guess, doing those projects through relationships. And what kind of, I guess, marketing do you do? And I'm mm -hmm. using that loosely because mm -hmm. you're kind of, you have a certain decision maker or mm -hmm. decision makers that you have to reach. Like, mm -hmm. what do you find to be effective to kind of push the needle? Mm -hmm. Um, just showing up and being present in the community. So we, I don't, we have never paid for any sort of advertising. I do our Instagram. We kind of stopped doing Facebook a while ago. Um, but it's really just volunteering and doing community work. Um, a lot of design firms enter competitions. That's a really good way to, to kind of move up in the design world. It's also a lot of time and energy that goes to something that if you're not selected, no one benefits from it. So yep. we made a decision in our business plan that said we're not going to do competitions. Instead, mm. we're going to do pro bono work that benefits our community. Uh, and it. so I think that's how we've gotten to make friends and know a lot of people um, is you know, volunteering to design a park or... Um, starting the foundation for the Elizabeth River Trail with other colleagues and, you know, designing a lot of things for the trail pro bono. And, and that's how we, we meet so many people that way. How do you stay on top of your, your craft and your industry? Mm -hmm. Are you going, do you go to trade shows or any conferences? Or? Yes. So everyone, everyone really gets to choose what conference they want to go to. So um, I tend to do I'm, like I said, I'm a big lighting nerd, so I try to go to lighting stuff if I can. Um, my time mostly has been set, spent on um, the American Institute of Architects and kind of giving back to the profession. Um, my partner, Tom, is at the Building Museums Conference in Chicago right now, um, trying to win work to do museum work all over the country. Um, another, Jacob, went to NAS Timber Conference in Portland and trying to finally get a mass timber building built here and kind of push that work. So if someone's interested in something, we support it and, and whatever that varied interest is, and we'll bring it back to WPA and find a way for it to have a positive impact. And do you have like advisors or do you have people that you look to for mm -hmm. advice? Um, yes. Uh, well, we have, a, we have our, our team of people that help us, you know, with HR and accounting and that of, all of that stuff. Um, and, and honestly, they've been huge advisors to us. Um, they've been, they're a part of our core team. So everything that's open books with us is open books with that team. Our accountant comes to us every single week. Um, uh, so we feel as we've grown as a business, she's grown with us. And, you know, in the beginning, when you're starting out and you, you don't have a lot of um, budget to play around with, you know, it's who do you ask if you can afford to buy this new thing, you That's know? Right. So we started out with that advisors at that very basic level. Um, and now it's more friends and colleagues we've met in the business community, for me a lot through the Greater Norfolk Corporation. Mm -hmm. And so that's my kind of, network of people that if I had um, a really tough business um, question, I would reach out to those folks. And what are you most excited about? It could be a project mm -hmm. or something coming up or something you've already done. Yeah. Um, there are two projects. Well, there's a bunch of projects, but I'll talk about a couple in the office that are really special right now. One um, is the new science building at Norfolk State. Um, we have a a client you've been with for that many years, that's a big deal. And a science building is the most complex type of building. So it's, it's fun. It's a fun problem to solve. Um, we're working on a community or a neighborhood center in Old Hampton. And that project, I think, is one of the most special projects. Um, it's a neighborhood that started as one of the grand contraband camps. Um, so post-Civil War... Um, uh, it was the first grand contraband camp over there after Fort Monroe um, 
And so these houses were built and uh, years later in the in years of urban renewal, uh, there was a lot of blight in the center. And so um, houses were torn down to make this park. And then they, all of a sudden there were no eyes on the park and a lot of crimes started to happen. And the area, the neighbors started referring to it as blood block because there had been so many shootings. Um, so we had the chance to work with the neighborhood and we've designed a master plan that puts um, the original road back in place and evens it out and builds new homes. So kind of restoring what was there, but evening it out a little bit and then designing a new neighborhood center for the whole community that they can rally around. They'll actually run the community center and um, it's being named for Mary Jackson, who, um, if you've seen Hidden Figures, was one of the NASA scientists. So it's, yes. it's, it was the coolest thing because, you know, in a, in a tough couple of years of politics and everything to go into that community and have the most civil discussions um, with people that had all different kinds of stresses and design this building with them that's now moving forward. That's, that's like the kind of work we love to do. It's super, that's cool, it's important um, as well. It is. Um, what have we not covered here? What, what do you want to uh, let the listeners know or any parting um, words of wisdom? Yeah, um, I guess the, the only other thing uh, through our urban design work, um, we've developed expertise in coastal resilience work. So when the city brought uh, the Dutch over, I guess about five or six years ago for the Dutch Dialogues, we started learning about um, all of the original watersheds and where our city floods. And I think uh, what's happening now is every project that we do seems to connect to the next project. And it's usually through, um, through the urban design side, through the coastal flooding um, issues. So the Chrysler is our clients and the Hermitage and every, uh, the Elizabeth River project and every client and project connects itself to each other. So when, when you find that happening, it starts to feel really good because you get people connected and projects connected. And then all of a sudden it feels like you build this network of design projects that help each other. That's super cool. Um, and I guess that's the same with people and relationships and, and building a business. Absolutely. Well, where can, uh, where can the listeners follow you and learn more and connect with you? Um, yeah. Where can they follow? Uh, on Instagram. Uh, I guess Rick posts things to our LinkedIn, um, our website. Not as media savvy as you. We don't have a podcast yet. No, it's all good. But we're going to we have a podcast room in our new building. So maybe we'll start a podcast yeah, and, and we can interview you. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I want to be on. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a new building? Um, uh, we're moving into assembly, which is 400 uh, with yes. Drew and his team. So, um, cool. those are our friends who have been doing community work for over a decade. We've been working together. And so it's pretty cool to get to support that project and be a part of it. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing yeah. this. Thank you.